Today, I want to introduce you to ecosystems and environmental organization. Ecosystems are part of ecology, and ecology is the study of how organisms interact with their environment, and that includes both abiotic and biotic factors in the environment. And we're going to get into what abiotic and biotic mean very soon. But first, I want to tell you about the five levels of how the earth and environment is organized. So this means what are the different levels of environmental organization? And we're going to start with the organism itself. So the organism is an individual animal, plant, or single celled life form. So that organism is the very basis and the first level of environmental organization. So we're starting out with the least complex level. That doesn't mean that an organism itself is not complex. We're just going to build upon this as we go up the levels of environmental organization. In this example, you can see that the butterfly is the example we use. So that's the organism in the example. The next level is a population. And a population is defined as a group of interbreeding species in a given ecosystem. This example, I'm showing you three bats or all of the bats that live in this ecosystem. And it's got to be this defined area. So the bats that live, let's say, in the rainforest in South America are going to be in a different population than the bats that might live in your hometown. So those are the constraints for a population. It could be all of the deer that live in the um, forest near you. It could be all of the fish that live in a pond or all of the grasshoppers that live in your backyard and area. The next level is a community. The community is different from a population in that now we are grouping all of the populations and species that live and interact in an ecosystem. If we're talking about the rainforest, for example, you can see that we're looking at all of the tigers, the butterflies, the monkeys, and I've also included the ferns. And that's one important thing to note, that it's all the populations of plants and animals that live in this ecosystem. So it would include trees, grasses, mosses, and every other population that exists here. The next level as we go up is the ecosystem. The question is, how is an ecosystem different than a community? And in an ecosystem, it's the community of organisms. So all of those populations we just talked about, but we are also adding in the non-living parts of the environment. So the non-living parts in this environment would include things like what? What non-living things can you identify in this rainforest? The first thing that comes to mind for me is we've got soil. Soil is not alive, but it does allow all of those plants and trees to get the nutrients that it needs. Also, we have sunlight. In a rainforest, sunlight is a scarce resource because the canopy, which is the tops of the trees that form this barrier, makes it really hard for sunlight to get all the way down to the um, floor of the rainforest. And then you've also got things like water, which is a very important resource, oxygen, all those things that are not alive, but they're really important to keep the living things alive and well in that ecosystem. So the community is all of the living populations along with those non-living parts. The last part is the biosphere. And the biosphere is everywhere on Earth where life exists. So this is as deep down in Earth's crust where we can find life all the way up to the highest parts of the atmosphere where birds can exist. So everywhere on Earth where life exists, the biosphere. All right, so one important thing is that I want to show you visually how we organize the five levels of environmental organization from least complex, starting with an organism, going up population, then we build to the community, we go to the ecosystem, and the biosphere is the most complex. Now, every single level here is complex. So when we say least complex, we know that one single frog is going to be less complex than, let's say, a thousand frogs that live in that rainforest. And then those thousand frogs are complex, but they will be less complex 
then the thousand frogs and tigers and monkeys and ferns. And then we go up to the ecosystem where we add in all of the non-living things that are really important for the living things like water, sunlight, rocks, soil. And then of course the biosphere is everywhere on planet earth that life exists, which is a very large area. One thing about an ecosystem is that every ecosystem can only support so many organisms and a carrying capacity is the number of organisms that that ecosystem can comfortably support where all of the organisms can still get what they need to survive like food, water, habitat. And the carrying capacity is always going to, um, there are limits and limiting factors that are going to at some point limit how big that population can grow. For instance, let's say a pond. How many uh, bass can live in a pond where they can all get the food they need, the oxygen they need, the space they need? At some point, the amount of oxygen in the pond will run out if there's too many organisms in that pond or there might not be enough minnows for them to feed on. So limiting factors are a resource that is so scarce that it limits the size of a population, meaning that it can't grow without control. Other limiting factors could include how much water is available for, let's say, animals on an African savanna, when water can be very scarce and there's not a lot to go around. I want you to stop and take a second and think about what's a limiting factor that might affect an animal that lives in an ecosystem near you. There are lots that you could probably choose from, and I'm sure you have a good idea of what those might be. But next, let's talk about competition. Competition means that even in an ecosystem where there's lots of resources to go around, animals are gonna have to compete. And they're gonna have to compete not only against other populations, other species, but they're gonna also have to compete against members of their own species for things like food, shelter, finding a mate, a habitat, and other scarce resources. And they are going to have to compete to make sure that they get what they need. And sometimes there are organisms that are going to go without. The predators and prey in an ecosystem play a really important role. And that relationship is really important because predators can be adapted, meaning their bodies and physical characteristics can be adapted to best hunt animals and they can do things, you know, behaviorally, meaning that they can hunt prey and they can have certain behaviors that help them hunt better. They might even have things in their body that have adapted to hunt better, like a cheetah can run up to 60 miles per hour, which definitely helps it hunt its prey because it's so fast. But prey also have adaptations, meaning that they're adapted to help defend themselves against predator. And three important prey adaptations, you can see the poison dart arrow frog in the top left has defensive chemicals and it has warning coloration. It gets its name poison dart arrow frog because these used to be used, uh, the actual poison in their bodies would be put on the tip of an arrow and people would hunt using that because it would help um, kill their prey. And when they were shooting animals with those arrows, it was able to knock them unconscious. And so that's where the poison dart arrow frog gets its name. It's brightly colored, which tells other animals, be warned, we are poisonous. And it's also got those chemicals. So if they do try to eat it, it is going to harm the animal that's taking it, that in. The next one is camouflage. And I've got this rabbit right here. And rabbits are camouflaged to blend in with their surroundings. Like this brown rabbit would blend in with brush and other things that are tan. So it makes it really hard for prey predators like a hawk or an eagle or something flying above to see it as well. Just to recap this lesson, we talked about the five levels of environmental organization, starting with the least complex, the organism going up to the most complex, the biosphere. We said that biotic factors are all of the living parts of an ecosystem, 
whereas abiotic factors are all of the non-living parts of an ecosystem, like rocks, water, soil, sunlight. And then we talked about limiting factors, which limit how big a population can grow, competition for resources in every ecosystem exists, and a carrying capacity is how many populations or organisms an ecosystem can comfortably support and everybody gets what they need. So this is just a brief introductory video for ecosystems. If you'd like to learn more about symbiotic relationships or food webs, I have other videos that you can find linked below. I also have an activity where your students can go through questions and they are going to answer things about the levels of environmental organization, biotic and abiotic factors, and some examples with limiting factors and carrying capacity and competition. And that is in my Teachers Pay Teacher Store. It is auto-graded, so it is very easy to use and post in Google Classroom, and I've linked that below. But if you have any questions about this lesson, things that you want to explain more, ask those below. And don't forget to like and subscribe to my channel. And I hope that this taught you something about ecosystems. And until next time, happy teaching, and I will see you in the classroom.